Thank you very much, Massimo, and thank you, the um, uh, Epodomo Research, for the invitation and the organization of this webinar. So um, I will talk about the clinical, the therapeutic uh, clinical implications of the molecular classification of uh, biliary cancers. So these are my disclosures. Um, Alejandro has already given quite uh, a nice and overview um, introduction to the topic. I just added this slide that to say that we'll also present the data about uh, gallbladder cancer along with the some glandular and subtype. So to really understand the uh, therapeutic implications of molecular classification and the importance of this topic, I think it is um, interesting to notice the change in the guidelines from 2016, where systemic chemotherapy was the only treatment recommended for non-resectable cholangiocarcinoma, uh, to the more recent uh, guidelines that have been published published just last year, where many changes have been introduced. And the one that I will focus on is the introduction of molecular profiling, which is now recommended for all patients who have an advanced or metastatic biliary tract cancer. And the reason why this is happening is because you see the molecular profiling is fundamental to um, guide in approach of the precision oncology in second line after the uh, failure of chemotherapy. Um, and this is all the uh, least or at least part uh, of, the of the molecular uh, alterations that we need to identify in our patient to really have a proper personalized uh, treatment in second line. Um, you see that this underlines the need to do molecular profiling because apart from some options in uh, all camera patients, uh, then we need to define the best treatment for single patients. Some of these drugs have received approval from the regulatory agency. Some others are still in uh, waiting in the line. Uh, and I will focus mainly on the implication of those targets for which therapeutics are already available. But before we move on to understanding which treatment we can offer our patients, I think it is important to discuss why, how, and you know, when we have to provide a the recommendation for a molecular profile. So yes, the guidelines suggest that we have to do to uh, biliary tract cancer patients. We do know that molecular alterations are usually enriched, or uh, that draggable molecular alterations are usually enriched in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So should we actually focus the recommendation only in this subgroup of patients? Well, my suggestion would probably be the opposite. It would be to include all biliary tract cancer patients, because as you can see on uh, this table, we can find a number of different molecular alterations that can be present around all different subtypes of cholangiocarcinoma. But we'll obviously need to keep in mind that some molecular alterations will be enriched in some subtypes. For example, genomic rearrangements of FGFR2 Mutations in NDH1 or mutations in BRAF will be enriched in the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, while R2 amplification can be found in extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and they will be enriched in gallbladder cancer. Without also thinking that sometimes in advanced disease, it's not always easy to differentiate you know, the source of the tumor uh, when the lesion is too large and involves too many organs. So when then do we need to um, describe a molecular profiling for our patients? We know that the targeted therapy will, at the moment, is limited to second line after failure to systemic treatment with cisplatin and gemcitabine or immunotherapy. So do we need to wait for this time before we send the molecular profiling? Well, that probably depends on the different institution and the different uh, healthcare boards. What we can tend, we, we can generally recommend is that we need to consider there will be logistical issues in uh, recruiting the tissue and then uh, retrieving the tissue and then send for the molecular testing and get results to be able to access drugs. So potentially, it might be better to actually start when the patients start the first line treatment. These patients compared to other tumor types might actually have a declination in their performance status in their fitness, fitness which might be faster compared to other patients. So we don't want just to let them wait for too long before we uh, can recommend a second line uh, precision oncology approach. 
It is also true that we have had a long discussion about reflex testing. So as soon as we have a histological diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma, either at the resection table um, during the resection time or at you know, the diagnostic biopsy, then a molecular profiling should be uh, submitted. However, you have to consider that we have about 30 patients with biliary tract cancer that will never undergo the systemic treatment, even for palliative uh, purposes. And so in a cost-effective uh, analysis, this might not be the most appropriate. So at the moment, what it would be recommended is to include a molecular profiling in all biliary tract cancer patients who actually start at least the first line um, systemic treatment. And uh, which are the therapeutic implications of a molecular profiling? So how can we classify biliary tract cancers to really uh, identify different therapeutics? You see that there is a number of different drugs that are available. I will mainly focus on the ones which have received approval, uh, either by FDA, but nowadays many of these have received approval also in Europe and other countries. And then we just spend a few lines, a few um, slides about uh, HER2 targeting therapies, because uh, even though these have not received approved approval yet, um, I think they are, you know, more reasonably um, easy to access within our clinical practice. So let's start from FGFR2 infusion. These um, include about 10% of intrahepatic, up to 20% in some cohorts of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And what can we offer to these patients? We now have three drugs that have, re have received approval. Uh, they all target FGFR2 infusions, and you can see that they are able to provide a response, a shrinkage in the tumor uh, at a rate of between 23 and 42% with the duration of the response, which actually can go up to 10 months. So it seems to be a durable control of the disease. And this translates into an advantage of the overall survival, which is the outcome we want to see, with an overall survival from the time the patient starts the second line treatment, which can go up to 20 months. And then you understand that this compares extremely favorable with the approach that we have as a non-targeted therapy, uh, which would be which include the chemotherapy with full FOX, or in some cases, even with full fear. So we usually have six months of overall survival since the patients start the second line treatment, but with FGFR2 inhibitor, we can reach up to 15, 17, and 20 months. It is of note to remember that these drugs, at least the first generation of these compounds, like pemigatinib, is active only when there is a fusion and genomic rearrangement of the FGFR2 gene and not when there are amplifications or mutations. So where are we going now? Where do we think we can evolve in this treatment? Well, one, we are looking now at the data of the pre-screening cohort of the pemigatinib trial, the 5202 trial, which led to the approval of pemigatinib. So these are mainly intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, but you see that the uh, FGFR2 fusion does not come on its own. It's usually associated also to other co-curing molecular alterations. Specifically, they tend to be associated with a BAP1 mutation, whose incidence seems to be a, a increased in FGFR2 rearranged tumors, while these tumors also seem to have less mutations in KRAS, TP53, and MB2. It's also not to notice that FGFR2 fusions can come along with a mutation in ADH1, which is interesting to really then put a, a right sequence for their treatment. What is clinically relevant is that the presence of these other molecular alterations actually can impact also on the response to the FGFR2 inhibitor. At least this is what has been seen with pemigatinib, in the sense that despite the presence of an FGFR2 fusion, an FGFR2 inhibitor might not be um, giving the same results we've seen before if there is also a mutation in TP53 and at a less extent also in CDKM2. So probably it's going to be important to not assess only one molecular target, but have a full genomic profiling to really understand which will be the response rate of these patients to targeted therapies. What we are, the, the, what the scientific community is trying to do is trying to develop inhibitors that actually are more specific. 
Um, we have heard about this data at the last ESMO in 2022, where uh, the increase in the specificity of uh, uh, the relay 1408 towards FGFR2 um, um, receptor actually seems to be uh, quite a successful, increasing the response rate from usually 40% to 82%. So really uh, giving us that uh, um, confidence that this disease is driven by FGFR2 infusion. And if we are able to target it, we can get a good control of, that, of the disease. Data on the overall survivals are, are still weighted. The other direction that is taken is also trying to um, expand the cohort of patients who can be eligible for an FGFR2 inhibitor and try to prolong the duration of response. Now, usually this we have seen before these uh, um, inhibitors can provide a duration of response of about 10 months, after which there is uh, the onset of resistance. And the resistance usually happens because uh, uh, there are new mutations uh, in the FGFR2, uh, different areas of the, of the gene. So the fact that the old generation inhibitors were not active against these mutations led to the resistance. It seems actually the compound of the newer generations will are active also against these new uh, de novo um, molecular uh, mutations like uh, futibatinib or relay 40Z, uh, 4008 or drazantinib seem actually to uh, give a longer uh, prolonged tumor control. It's also true that potentially they can also increase the number of patients who are eligible up front, because in this case, we are not including only those tumors with FGFR2 fusions, but we could include also those with specific mutations. Now let's move to um, IDH1 mutation. So what happens if uh, the molecular profiling identified a mutation in this gene? Well, we, would, we do have the data from the CLARDI trial, which is also the only phase three randomized clinical trial in the biliary tract cancer arena of uh, targeted therapies. Now, this IDH1 inhibitor is not able to give a high number of response rate, but it can stabilize the tumor. And this changes the progression-free survival rate uh, at 12 months uh, from a 0% in the placebo arm to 22% into the experimental arm. And these data also translate in an advantage of overall survival that is depicted by the green line in this graph, where you can see that after adjustment for crossover, we have about 10 months of overall survival after, uh, when in patients who start the second line, at least the second line treatment. Actually, majority of these patients had also received the resident in third line. Where are we going uh, into these, uh, in, in this field? Well, um, some preclinical data has suggested that tumors with the mutations in IDH1 could, um, um, could actually support a, an HRD phenotype and then be more responsive to DNA damaging agents. The data are still pending. We have some preliminary data from a retrospective cohort of an Italian multi-institutional study where the um, platinum activity has been tested and apparently doesn't seem uh, that the IDH1 mutation is associated with an increased response to platinum. The data on uh, PARP inhibitor are still awaited. On the other side, we do have some preclinical data which suggests that the IDH1 mutation might also change the immune um, response of the host. In fact, in animal models, we know that the metabolite that is produced as a result of the mutation in IDH1 can be not only internalized by the cancer cell and promote the growth of this, but also by the T cells and uh, can be driving a new invasive phenotype. So when mice were treated with the IDH1 inhibitor, along with an immunotherapy which was targeting CTLA4, you see that finally we tend to see those responses that we haven't seen in patients. So if this is going to be a successful strategy, something that we will um, we will have to wait and see, uh, but uh, definitely these data inspired the design of new phase trials, and new um, trials which are um, about to open. We then have, uh, a number of uh, druggable uh, targets, which actually um, would allow the um, um, ac access to different drugs uh, from uh, a tumor agnostic approval, and definitely uh, in this sense, it can also be used for, for cholangiocarcinoma patients. 
The first the one that I want to focus on is the mutation in BRAF, especially limited to B600E. In this case, it seems that the combination of a BRAF and MAC inhibitor is particularly interesting, with a response rate of 50% and a median overall survival of 14 months. Please consider that we are always talking about a second-line treatment, so we always have to keep in mind that the overall survival of six months with the normal chemotherapy. The data of uh, in cholangial carcinoma cohort are quite interestingly in the sense that we have 43 patients, but please note that mainly they are intrahepatic cholangial carcinoma. So how often can we expect to find a mutation in BRAF in uh, the patient we see in our clinic? Well, the data are still a little bit contradictory. If we go back to the pre-screening cohort of the phi 202 trial, we know that BRAF mutations with B600E sits at 4.8%. If we extend it to other cohorts which have a higher number of non intrahepatic cholangial carcinoma, these numbers can actually be lower down. In the metastatic cohort, we recently have the data from the Spanish group, which um, have observed an incidence of about 9 to 10% of BRAF mutation in a metastatic intrahepatic cholangial carcinoma, in, in metastatic biliary tract cancer, sorry. But majority of these were again intrahepatic cholangial. So we do have the data on the pembrolizumab, the immunotherapeutic. I would be very quick about this. I mean, probably because these data are now um, uh, less uh, um, clinically relevant uh, considering introduction of immunotherapy in first line. Obviously, if we have an MSI high tumor, we want to consider immunotherapy. But again, uh, uh, please think that this is an extremely rare phenotype to observe in bilateral cancers altogether. We do have a minority of a tumor um, that might have an alteration in NTRK, and uh, these uh, um, are uh, um, targetable uh, with uh, um, NTRK inhibitors, like, for example, Nfectinib. Uh, we don't have a lot of data on cholangial carcinoma, only two patients in the basket trials, but the interesting point is that across different tumor types, uh, it was observed a 100% response rate with these inhibitors in case of this specific molecular alteration. And this led to a tumor agnostic approval that if uh, feasible in biliary tract cancer, definitely should be pursued. More recently, we've seen the data about a RET inhibitor in RET-fused biliary tract cancer. Again, interesting, a very remarkably good results with 57% response rate and the median overall survival of 14 months. Again, we are talking about an extremely rare population across the cholangial carcinoma cohort. Now let's move to some drugs for which we don't have a regulatory approval yet, but uh, um, involves drugs that we have been quite familiar with uh, in other tumor types. So we are talking about uh, R2 amplification first. So tumor with an R2 amplification can be treated with different strategy. Um, the oldest data we have is uh, from uh, the My Pathway trial in the biliary tract tract cancer cohort, which included the 39 cases, and where it was shown that a combination of pertuzumab and trastuzumab could actually give a good median overall survival of almost 11 months in second line with a median duration of response of almost 11 months. The response rate is not extremely high, um, obviously compares favorably well with the response rate that usually we observe with for Fox, which sits below 10%. But the interesting point is also that for the first time, probably, uh, we see that there is a good cohort of non intrahepatic cholangial carcinoma patients that can be suitable for targeted therapies. In fact, the, um, uh, the, this molecular target is usually found better in ampullary or in gallbladder cancer. More recently, we've seen the data of a NER2 inhibitor uh, combined with chemotherapy. The data seems to be quite interesting as well. And I think it, uh, it opens up uh, you know, a possibility in those patients where we want also to provide some chemotherapy in case we need a um, um, quicker control of symptoms and we think chemotherapy may actually have an impact if it is a um, um, highly proliferated tumor. 
We have just seen only preliminary data about the association of trastuzumab and deruxtecan. This is a conjugated drug uh, of a chemotherapy associated with L2. We do see contrasting results, so I think that we still need some more data. It seems to be promising uh, in the L2 positive cohort where we have, uh, you know, at least a uh, G plus for L2. But uh, uh, this drug in other tumor types has shown efficacy in L2 low cohort, and we don't know if this is going to be the case. Just a few uh, words about uh, a new drug uh, for uh, mutations of LB2. So we're not talking about amplification anymore. The Renatinib has shown some activity. These are the data presented at ASCO last year. Um, I don't present this data because they are particularly interesting. You see a response rate only in 16%. But because if we go back to see the translational component of this study, again, one more, we see that uh, the activity of this drug is present only if we have really identified the molecular drive uh, and that mutation is a driver uh, mutation for that tumor. So if there are no co-curing molecular alterations, then yes, we tend to see a response. But if there are other co-molecular alterations, most of the time we don't see a good clinical outcome. And this is something that we have also seen in our clinical uh, practice. This is uh, um, one of our patients, uh, bull bladder cancer, chemorefractory, which uh, um, has undergone a profiling both in the tissue and in the blood. And you can see she was found with an amplification of RB2, but also was associated with an amplification of EGFR. Now, the interesting point is that when we had to request approval uh, access to the drug, because of the simultaneous um, amplification of EGFR, we decided to go with a combination of trastuzumab, but also lapatinib. And it was interesting to notice that the patient initially had a very good response, as you can see from the reduction of the tumor marker, which was really dramatic. But uh, when we had to suspend the lapatinib, the EGFR targeting drug because of diarrhea, then the tumor started to grow very quickly. And uh, this was also seen on the CTDNA analysis of this patient where there was a good control of the tumor and then it started to grow up again. And the kind of the novel mutations that were responsible for this uh, second phase of growth were more typical of what we usually see with resistant to EGFR inhibitor. Really suggest we have to do a molecular profiling to really understand if there is one driving molecular alteration or if there are other companion molecular alterations that might actually be responsible for the growth of the tumor. So how do we need to do the test? Well, uh, uh, because we have talked about mutations, we have talked about the genomic rearrangements and copy number variation, obviously we need to combine these technologies together. So ideally we need to combine RNA sequencing with DNA sequencing. Uh, there are uh, in cases where we can look for Fischer immunohistochemistry in case of you know, FGFR2 fusions, we can do a FISH or RB2 amplification, we could do a FISH. But remember that in this case, you would only look at one target and you would lose you know, the overall picture. So given the difficulty of the retrieving tissues and given the difficulty of applying all this technology in what we usually have a limited sample, do we need to move on to the liquid biopsy? Well, the answer is still yes and no, because uh, we have learned now that if we are looking for mutations, obviously lipid biopsy can also can almost be um, can almost replace the tissue molecular profiling with a concordance of about 87%. But if we are looking for fusions and genomic rearrangement, the data are still contradictory. So we have seen from the putibatinib trial that some technologies can give a, a, um, a, um, a concordance rate of about 87% between the plasma and uh, the tissue. But from other studies using, using different technologies, the concordance rate was lowered down at 18%. So if this is really the moment to move into liquid biopsy for getting the tissue is something that I think we still, um, we still need to discuss. And with this, I want to conclude and say that, yes, there is a clinical implication of achieving a molecular classification for cholangiocarcinoma, and potentially the molecular profiling should be recommended to all our patients when they start the first-line treatment. Thank you.